Good evening. I'm Matt Greer. I'm the music director here at St. John's United Methodist Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Welcome to this very special concert presentation this evening. Ever since lockdown began, we have been presenting a variety of musical experiences, and tonight is one that we've been particularly looking forward to for a couple of reasons. The first is that for the last several years now, one of our regular musical offerings to the community has been a series we call the St. John's Bach Project. And being in the business of church music, we believe that the greatest music ever written for the context of Christian worship was the music written by J.S. Bach. So for the past many years, we've been presenting concerts, mostly of the cantatas and the instrumental works. And I'm very happy to say that that project is continuing. We had a concert just a few weeks ago that you can find here on our YouTube channel. We've got another one coming up in June. And tonight, we're very happy that the concert we're presenting is under the auspices of the St. John's Bach Project. The other reason we've been looking forward to this evening, of course, is that we are so happy to present our brilliant colleague, the assistant music director here at St. John's, Therese McCauley, for whom this lecture recital is a culminating project as she is about to finish a degree in music at the University of New Mexico. We're very proud of Therese and so happy to be presenting this. Now, a couple of things I would mention. There is a printed program that you can follow along with if you click on the link in the chat. And also, because I'm the guy who looks after the budget around here, I might mention that you could make a donation to the St. John's Bach Project by also clicking one of the links in the chat. If you feel so moved, you might make a gift in honor of Therese McCauley this evening in celebration of what she's doing. We're so happy that you're here to experience this music with us. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome. Why Bach? Bach is ideally just like everyone else, but he gets thrust into the category of musical genius. He wasn't the only composer at the time. There were many other composers at the time, composers that had access to the same talent, the same resources, the same instrument, and the same vocalists. Then why is he any different? Why do we still perform and dissect his music and his life hundreds of years later? Why the funding for festivals and projects? How is it possible that J.S. Bach in inspires us still? Too often, lectures begin like this. J.S. Bach was born in 1685 in Eisenach into a musical family. We don't need to hear the biography. We can get that in any appreciation class. What we want to understand is the hagiolatry, as Gardner puts it in his biography of Bach. I love that word, hagiolatry. In my religious studies coursework, I've read the hagiography of saints, or the writings about the lives of the saints. But Gardner reminds us of our human ability to employ idolatry, and we do. We put these composers on pedestals. Surely their contributions to the arts or to the faith absolves them from any traits of humanity, their ability to sin, or even their ability to be human at all. But it's important to remember that once a piece of music becomes published, performed, and given to the public, it becomes its own entity, and it takes on a life of its own. It no longer is an extension of the composer's personality, and therefore no longer an extension of the person's biography. So it comes down to belief. What people do confirms and demonstrates what people believe. If you're a student watching this, thank you. But if you're a student watching this, then you believe that music has power over you, or you wouldn't pour hours rehearsing, crying in practice rooms, or spending a Saturday evening watching a lecture, making sure that you have enough credits for recital attendance. If you're a lover of music, or even Bach himself, then you're here watching this because you believe that there is something worthy of your time and energy. Guys, I've seen everything on Netflix since the pandemic, and we're allowed to kind of be outside now. But instead, you're watching this. Thank you. Your actions are proof of your belief. And we already talked about the proof of belief in J.S. Bach, the funding, the performances, the study, and the legacy that is J.S. Bach. So let's begin.
can see in a Bach fugue that it is one of the most rigorous and clever disciplines that music has to offer. To me, a fugue is like our own process of thought. We think by comparison, by analogy, by going back over our tracks and comparing speeds, sounds, and results. We remember, and then we think ahead. A fugue is like that. In a fugue, the theme appears again and again in different registers and keys. It's often presented four times in succession, once in each voice. Once launched, each of these voices continues independently while complementing the others as they enter. The other voices fill out the harmonic pattern while retaining separate identities, as if each voice has a will of its own. This form does not originate with Bach, but he definitely mastered it. Any of these themes in his music can be presented in double time or half time, depending on the confidence of the musician. But like the many speeds of our heartbeats, it corresponds with the human cycle of life. The world is made up of rhythms, stages of human life, of birth and death, of everyday highs and lows, the cycle of the moon. Held up like a mirror to all of these rhythms is a special calendar. It's the calendar of the liturgical year. The word liturgy comes from the Greek meaning public service. There are eight seasons in the liturgical year, Advent, Christmas, Ordinary Time, Lent, Holy Week, Easter, Pentecost, and then Ordinary Time one more time. Advent is the four weeks leading up to Christmas. Advent connects with the very human experience of hopeful beginnings, of setting out, of looking forward to new life and anticipating opportunities. Christmas is the celebration of the birth of Jesus, the welcoming of new light and love into the world. After Christmas is ordinary time. Ordinary means ordered time, not boring time, and it comes from the Latin ordinalis. It, re it represents living life as it unfolds, as we grow in experience and wisdom. Liturgically, this is when we walk with Jesus. The readings of the church focus on Christ's daily life and teaching and it's the experience of ourselves, of others, and God in ordinary ways. Lent is the 40 days leading up to Easter. On Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, ashes are distributed to remind us the cycle of our earthly life, which brings us to Holy Week and the Holy Paschal Triduum. The days of the Triduum speak powerfully to the experience of loss and death. It's an amazingly intense three days, and they lead to the season of Easter the celebration and the resurrection of Jesus. Easter falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon of the vernal equinox because the Passover Jesus celebrated on Holy Thursday would have fallen in accordance with the Jewish lunar calendar. Easter is about renewal and rebirth, the universal rhythm of darkness to light, winter to spring, death to new life. On the 50th day after Easter comes Pentecost, which means 50th day, and celebrates the descent of the Holy Spirit on the first apostles. And after Pentecost, we come full circle to another season of ordinary time. The readings and the rites of the church here are a spiritual framework, and it's cyclical, giving us many chances to re-experience loss and joys in new ways. We do the same thing with music. We can listen to pieces over and over again with new appreciations and anticipations. When listening to a fugue, repetition of a theme offers us a psychological security. But the form of a fugue is not rigid. It can contain personal elements that connect us with music. What is the thing that keeps us listening to the same piece over and over and over again? Connection. Bach's job was to create music that connects us enough to God and each other to keep us coming back every Sunday. By combining music, science, math, and religion, Bach moved people's hearts while disciplining their minds in a compelling living experience in real time. There's almost nothing that we can really add to the story of someone like J.S. Bach. His music is well known, and it's not like we're getting any new first-hand sources that illuminate who he was as a person. At best, we can hope to fill in the gaps around the sides of the research, even though the main themes of who he was and what he did has long been settled by scholarship. So we begin with Bach's musical and religious heritage, the Protestant Reformation. Thank you. 
Martin Luther famously posted his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church, an event that most scholars would agree started the Protestant Reformation. This was an event that would completely change the course of political and religious history, not only in Europe, but the entire world, and it also directly influenced the course of music history. Martin Luther's post wasn't actually the beginning, though. In the 14th and 15th centuries, men like John Wycliffe or Jan Haus began speaking out against the increasing corruption in the Catholic Church. They spoke out against things like indulgences, purgatory, and they even made a push for the Bible to be written in the native language of the people. So during the service, the people could understand what they were singing and what they were praying with. Well, Jan was burned at the stake, and John Wycliffe died of natural causes, but after the Pope declared him a heretic, they banned his writings, unburied his body, and burned his bones. Woof. Many of the things that these men were speaking out against, Martin Luther would later speak out against in 1517. What we now know as Germany at that time was part of the Holy Roman Empire. It had no official association with the church, and its borders didn't even contain Rome, and the empire was made up of hundreds of tiny little kingdoms throughout Germany whose kings may or may not have actually listened to the emperor. As of 1517, it was being run by Maximilian I, and after Maximilian died in 1519, his grandson Charles V of Spain took over. Luther posted his famous document never having intended to start his own church or even leave the Catholic Church. He was just asking for change. Perhaps this would have amounted to nothing more than a dispute between monks had it not been for all of the distractions that were facing the church and the state at the time. Pope Leo X, is very involved with the European politics and is particularly preoccupied with the politics surrounding the Holy Roman Empire. He was trying to raise money for a brand new state-of-the-art basilica that he was building. He was offering time out of purgatory as an incentive to donate. Purgatory is kind of like a waiting room for some people before they can get into heaven. After Luther posted his theses though, many of the nobility took this as an opportunity to not only oppose the Pope, but the Holy Roman Empire itself. And that is a huge prob problem for an emperor whose empire is already not really under his control. Not only that, but the Holy Roman Empire wasn't Charles V's only domain. Charles not only inherited all of this land in Europe, but he inherited vast amounts of land in North and South America that Spain had been colonizing for the last century or so. With all of the uprisings in the Americas and France, Charles hadn't really been keen on dealing with a little theological disagreement. So he didn't really respond. Luther's teachings began to rise in popularity in 1521, and the Pope decided, hey, I should probably do something about that. So the Pope calls this huge hearing and asks Luther to recant his writings. Luther responds with, nope. Of course, this made the Pope very unhappy. <laughs> and he excommunicated Luther. Charles seems rather annoyed that he has to deal with any of this at all, so he called the Diet of Worms, hoping to expose Luther as a heretic and put the whole matter to bed, so he could go back to focusing on the Spanish army who was mistreating the Native Americans in the New World. In the end, the emperor declared Luther a heretic. He made giving food or shelter completely illegal, and he even said that if anybody killed Luther, they wouldn't get charged. He, had he was smuggled out of town by Frederick III of Saxony. While Luther began his German translation of the Bible, the Holy Roman Empire was becoming increasingly split down religious lines. Shortly after that, the Schmaldalkin League, an alliance of Lutheran kingdoms, was formed. And after about 20 years of fighting, the Peace of Augsburg was signed in 1555, which legally allowed kingdoms to choose either Catholic or Lutheran as their official religion. Of course, the Reformation didn't end here, and it wasn't limited to just Germany. Some scholars argue that it never ended at all. Either way, these events not only reshaped political and religious history, but also music history. This was a relatively quiet period for Germany musically. Music of the 15th century in Germany and other parts of Europe were largely influenced by Heinrich Isaac. He was a Franco-Flemish composer, born in the Netherlands, but he moved to Italy. During this time, he got to experience the Italian homophonic style. Then, in 1497, he was hired by Maximilian himself to become the court composer for the Holy Roman Empire. He was a contemporary of Josquin de Pré, who was arguably the most prominent composer of that generation. Josquin de Pré was admired by, you got it, Martin Luther. And now we've come full circle to the Reformation. 
it's important for us to understand Bach's theology and his deep roots in the Protestant Reformation. As I said before, we're trying to use this information to create an understanding of the man, J.S. Bach. It's important that we do not impose ourselves and our understanding of the world upon how Bach must have understood himself and his works. We understand our approach to religion post-Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, or Aufklärung as it was in Germany, was the premier social thought culture of Bach's time. It highlights and empowers the individual to rise out of a caste system into their own understanding of knowledge, freedom, and happiness. These ideas affect how we as Americans conceive core concepts such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So how do we even know what Bach believed then? When we look into his possessions, surely his Bible would give us insights as to his belief. Bach's Bible is a three-volume translation of the Bible with commentary by Abraham Caleb based on Martin Luther's sermons and other writings. Both Bach's music and his Caleb notations put powerful stress upon the Bible being a source of truth for humans. Humans being completely reliant on God, promotion of Orthodox Lutheranism over other religions, upholding the priority of German faithfulness over foreigners, and the monarchy as authorized not by the people but by God. In short, Bach in his unswerving religious conservatism was living and working very much at odds with the progressivist currents of his day, and ours as well. And while we're allowed to utilize him and his music in whatever new ways we want, we should be aware of our tendency of molding Bach into our own image. Lent is the season of 40 days of repentance and purification in preparation for the new life of Easter. It begins on Ash Wednesday. Ashes are a biblical symbol of mourning and repentance, but there is a suggestion of comfort and renewal in this season as well. This topic is very large in the music of J.S. Bach. One third of his cantatas contain the word trost, or comfort. Out of the reminder of our mortality and impermanence of life, Bach makes the music of life. J.S. Bach's elder brother was placed in charge of 10-year-old Johann Sebastian when his father died not even a year after the death of his mother. 
We don't know much about J.S. Bach learned about music up until that point. It was likely that he learned some from his father, who, as we know, was unnecessarily harsh. An example of this. Published music was extremely rare and expensive in those days, and Bach's dad had a great volume of organ pieces that he would never share with baby Bach. J.S. wanted to get to those pieces, but his dad always stopped him. J.S. was small enough, though, that he could reach his hands through the latticework of the cabinet, roll up the pieces, pull it out, and copy it onto his own manuscript paper by, by moonlight. When Bach was 15, he was enrolled in the prestigious St. Michael School in Lundberg, where he met composer and organist Georges Bohm. It was through Bohm that Bach began to really be involved in the musical world. His first job out of school was as a court musician in Weimar. Bach was required to compose and lead a performance of a new secular cantata each month. He also had sacred music duties, and through this he met Pastor Neumeister, who supplied him with texts. Bach's second job was at a new church in Arnstadt, but once he got the post, tensions started to come up. You see, Bach was someone who was cared so deeply about perfection, and he held himself and others to the same high standard. One time he wrote a really difficult bassoon passage. The bassoonist complained. Bach called this guy either a weenie or a nanny goat, depending on how literal you want the translation to get. Swords were drawn. Everybody was fine, but the church was slightly unpleased. It was around the same time that Bach had a four-week leave of absence approved, so he decided he was going to use that opportunity to hear Dietrich Buxtehude play in Lübeck. The problem is that Lübeck is something like 300 miles away, and Bach apparently decided to walk there and back. You can't effectively do that in four weeks. So instead, he took four months, and when he got back to Arnstadt, the church was definitely not happy with him. Bach said that he went to Lübeck in order to study from Buxtehude. But he found out that Buxtehude was looking for a new organist. The problem is that the job in Lübeck came with one very specific condition. Whoever was going to take over for Buxtehude had to marry his daughter, Anna Margarita. In 1703, two years before Bach visited, some guy named George Friedrich Handel, I don't know, decided to audition, but did not get the job because he didn't want to marry Anna Margarita. Bach didn't get the job either, and some scholars have suggested that Anna Margarita must have been exceptionally unattractive. But a more reasonable explanation is simply one of age. In 1703, Anna Margarita would have been 28, where Handel, who was born the same year as Bach, would have been 18 years old. And unfortunately, in those years, if you were a woman and you weren't married by your mid-20s, you were basically dead. And besides, why would Bach want to marry this cougar when he had a super sweet second cousin back home? In 1706, he got a job in Mulhausen, and this is where he married his second cousin, Maria Barbara. He had impressed his employers enough that they promoted him to Concertmeister, which is where he began writing cantatas on a much more consistent basis. After a while, he wore out his welcome. He insisted that he be dismissed. And with jobs back then, you basically had what amounted to a very, very specific clause in your contract that you couldn't just quit if you wanted to. You needed to get a letter requesting your dismissal, and if you didn't get that letter, you were stuck working for the same schmuck that you were working for. They got so fed up with him, though, that they ended up throwing him in jail for a month and then dismissing him. Prince Leopold of Anhalt Kulten immediately snatched him up for the court chapel, where Bach served as Kapellmeister. The prince was a Calvinist, whereas Bach was a Lutheran, and that affected Bach's output because the role of music was quite different between those two belief systems. Bach's weekly church-related duties drastically decreased, and he used that spare time to write instrumental music for the court, such as the Brandenburg Concertos. This was a prestigious position, and the most any composer could really ask for, and Bach had done it by the age of 32. Unfortunately, in the summer of 1720, he accompanied his employ employer, Prince Leopold, on a visit to Carlsbad Spa. When he returned home, he found out that Maria Barbara had died and been buried while he was away. This is perhaps one of the most tragic events of Bach's life. In looking at someone's life through the lens of history, it's easy to romanticize the tragedy of death. As humans, we want to soften the harsh edges of death and rosy the cheeks of death's pale face. We fear death. In fear, we lose our trust in God. 
we become self-protective and self-centered, diminished in our ability to live in harmony with others. These are the natural cycles of the human experience. These themes present themselves often in the life of Bach. Death, suspicion of authority, abrasive relationships with others. Let us understand this side of Bach with compassion and let our souls meet Bach theologically and musically as we understand him and ourselves more deeply. Bach would remarry in two years to Anna Magdalena, a soprano. In addition to pretty much being pregnant all the time, she continued her career as a soprano and served as a copyist for many of her husband's works. 
to the point that many of J.S. Bach's pieces only survived in their earliest form in Anna Magdalena's hand. She then sold these copies to make some extra money if she needed. Prince Leopold got married in 1721 and the musical life of the court declined through 1722. So in 1723, Bach got fed up and he asked to be dismissed. Prince Leopold obliged. Bach landed in Leipzig. This would be his last position and he would end up dying in Leipzig. One of his duties was to write a new cantata and for years he produced a 30 minute cantata every single week. Each one served as the role of sermon because it expounded upon a text. He did this so well that he was later nicknamed the fifth evangelist. The idea was that Bach was so good at conveying the gospel that he was responsible for more believers than the actual writers of the Bible. Let's dig into an example of this. The crucial term in Cantata 61 and of the Advent season is come. This is the season in which believers prepare to celebrate the coming of Jesus as a baby born in Bethlehem. It's also a time to prepare the hearts of the believers to receive him not only daily, but to greet him when he comes in the end times. The first movement initiates the idea with the phrase nun kom, or now come, and is echoed throughout. The second movement is the declaration that the Savior has come, or Heiland ist gekommen, while the third is a prayer, kom Jesu kom, or come, Jesus come. To fulfill the prayers of the faithful, Arya 5 declares, Jesus kommt und sieht ein, or Jesus comes and enters. Finally, the chorale declares, Amen, amen, come you lovely crown of joy. If the theological practice of the cantata was to be a music sermon, what then does the congregation take from cantata 61 that fortifies the faith of the congregation that has heard this tale before? The idea was that cantatas could be fresh, new compositions, and no doubt the congregation had already picked out their favorite Christmas hymns. This cantata takes listeners through the original coming of Jesus, his coming to the church, his coming into the hearts of the believers, and his glorious coming in end times. The question arises though, can this medium theologically depict the true humility of God? It's movement five, of Dick mein ganzes Herze, that the audience understands the humility of Christ in his coming into the hearts of believers. This man that is fully God can only enter into a heart that's open. This simple setting lightly shifts the power to the soprano, praying that her heart may open for Jesus to enter. And that points to the power of the chorale at the ending. The congregation can wait with longing for Christ to come as they themselves prepare to open their hearts. Now, the courts employed female singers, which is how his wife stayed employed, but churches still used boy sopranos. What this meant was that the highest and most prominently sounding voices were those with the least amount of training. You couldn't ask boy sopranos to do, you know, very virtuosic things with their voices. So Bach compensated with this oftentimes by making the soprano line the easiest one. It would be like the chorale tune setting and then all of the inner and lower voices being more elaborate. In addition, he had an orchestra that could double the soprano line. This is part of the reason why a lot of cantatas are based on established Lutheran chorales because they were familiar and easier to sing. The typical structure for a cantata is a large opening movement, which is elaborating on the first line of the chorale. Then you have a bunch of inner movements, which alternate between arias and recitatives, which is exactly how operas were structured at that time and how they would be structured for like a hundred and a half years. Then the final movement would be a relatively simple setting of the last line of the chorale. The full chorale tune appears at the end and is generally more contemplative. The complexity of these chorale cantatas is partly due to the fact that he had a small orchestra at his disposal that he didn't use to accompany or double lines with the exception of the soprano line, but they would work as an obligato instrument in and of themselves. These would be instruments that would work in counterpoint to the vocal line further expressing the texts. Bach originally wanted to write at least three years worth of cantata material to mirror the Holy Trinity. Additionally, that's also a mega cycle on which the church year was structured. He attempted a second three-year cycle, but after this, it got incomplete, and he managed about five years of cantatas. Still a good job. This is a tremendous amount of music. Let's take a moment to understand how the complete works of J.S. Bach are organized. 
A question that I've often been too embarrassed to ask in rehearsals is what exactly is a BWV number? Bach wrote 1,128 pieces of music, and there are at least 23 works which we think are lost. Each are uniquely identified by a BWV number. These numbers originate with the Bach Werke Verzeichnis Cataloging System, or BWV for short. They were compiled by Wolfgang Schmeider in 1950. Unlike catalogs of compositions by some other composers, BWV numbers are not in any sort of chronological order. Most of Bach's pieces were not published in his lifetime, and we don't really know exactly when they were written, so they're grouped thematically. Pieces with BWV numbers near each other tend to have similar instrumentation and musical styles. So this means cantatas are 1 through 224, motets are 225 through 231, Masses, mass parts, magnificats, 232 to 243, passions and oratorios, 244 to 249, four part chorales, 250 to 438, songs and arias, 439 to 524, works for organ, 525 to 771, keyboard compositions, 772 to 994, lute compositions, 995 to 1000, chamber music, 1001 to 1040, works for orchestra, 1041 to 1071, canons, 1072 to 1078, musical offerings in the art of the fugue, it's 1079 to 1080. But wait, Wait, didn't I say 1,128? Yes, I did. Thanks for remembering. The Anhang of the BWV lists number 1 through 23 as lost works or works with a fraction that have survived. Numbers 24 through 155 as works with dubious authenticity. And numbers 156 through 189 as works attributed to Bach, but not necessarily composed by him. It's very helpful to refer to Bach's pieces by their BWV numbers. Bach is the original millennial and didn't care too much for titles or labels, and often the titles are similar in theme or muddied during translation. BWVs help us make sure that we're in the same piece at the same time and on the same page. With time, Bach's health was going downhill fast and he had eye problems. So he turned to a fellow named John Taylor, which was a disaster. Taylor was an utter quack even by the standards of that time. He was responsible for blinding hundreds of people across Europe. Bach just needed his cataracts taken out and there were primitive methods at the time in doing this but Taylor just straight up blinded him. Taylor as it happened would do the exact same thing to Handel. Because of this failed operation Bach got sick and he died some months later in July in 1750 at the age of 65. While Bach's influence was very profound, it took the better part of a century for the modern Bach revival to really take off. This started with a performance of the St. Matthew Passion directed by Felix Mendelssohn in 1829. It needs to be said that Mendelssohn's performance was not what Bach had intended. It's not bad, but it's not what Bach had intended. He cut the music down to size and he reorchestrated passages to fit the kind of orchestra that he knew. This was an absolute banger of a performance though, and it cemented Bach almost overnight as one of the greatest composers to ever have lived. In defense of Mendelssohn, he made these changes to fit the tastes of his audience and to basically put Bach's best foot forward. Listeners today tend to think of Bach's music as being stereotypically Baroque. And indeed, there are many characteristics that of Bach's music that set it apart not just from music of the early classical period, but from other late Baroque composers as well. Bach synthesized many traditions and styles from across Europe, especially characteristic traits of dance rhythms from Germany, France, and Italy. Bach would take different elements of those different things from different parts of Europe and put them into the same piece. It's a very cosmopolitan approach, but to the average listener, just sounds like Baroque. In the 17th century, states of mind were known as affections, passions, or humors. Descartes was a rationalist, and he explored his understanding of these passions in his 1649 essay, The Passions of the Soul. Affections are not to be confused with feelings, though. Feelings are constantly apt to change, while affections are the constant base of our understanding of human experiences. In his theory, Descartes said that affections depended on the bodily fluids, known as the humors, which dictated one's state of mind by corresponding with the viscosity of the fluids, whether they went to the head or flowed downward. 
disclaimer, this application and this argument has nothing to do with actual anatomy whatsoever. Either way, he identified six basic passions, love, hate, joy, sorrow, wonder, and desire. Any others are a combination of those experiences. Particularly, particularly important for aesthetics was the belief that external stimuli could alter the consistency of these fluids and therefore our states of feelings. Therefore, a piece of art or music ought to provide a stimulus that would change the humors to produce the intended affection. It's not enough to depict joy. Art should make the listener feel joy, see joy, be joy. The religious experience, though, is one of ups and downs, and I believe something that changes and develops through time. That is also true of music. Notes go up and down, and they develop into something larger and more complete through time. How then, if affect is to stimulate a specific mood, does it enhance the spiritual journey and not just momentary feelings and responses? Although it's true that the response is immediate, it's upon further reflection that these moments become impressed upon us and change part of our character. It's not enough to hear a Bible story once for conviction to take our hearts over. Additionally, it's not enough to hear a piece of music once and think we, under, think we understand the complexities of affect as composed and performed moment of elicited response by an individual. In his compendium of music, Descartes states, the means to this end, i.e. the attributes of sound, are principally two, namely its differences in duration or time and its differences of tension from high to low. Descartes recognized that these musical exchanges of affects needed to deliberate arrangement of musical elements of pitch and time. If the goal of Bach was to mold the character of a Christian through music, let's explore the ways in which these two musical elements contribute to our understanding of music. There are conditional responses to music that we are acutely aware of. For example, Major, happy. Minor, sad. In the realm of music, Johann Madison applied Descartes' ideas in composition. In his important text dated 1739, Der Willkommen Kapellmeister, Johann Madison lived, listed everything needed to be a great church musician including the most complete discussion in the doctrine of affections in music, culminating in this statement. Everything in music that occurs without praiseworthy affections is nothing, does nothing, is worth nothing. Two of the many musical elements that Madison identified to correlate affects include key signatures and intervals. Large intervals represented joy. It's the expanding of the soul. It's the expanding of the body. That's why the notes are very far apart. Very far apart. Smaller intervals were the closing of the body, the smallening of the body with these sad feelings, and so the intervals are smaller. This also has to do with the key of music that's chosen. For example, C minor is sweet, but, but still a little bit sad because it's in minor. Or E major, that's the fatal separation of the body and the soul. I hope you got that and that you have perfect pitch. Examples of this in the pieces that I'm singing. Öffne dich is in G major, as is Hort Hilföcker. This is described as brilliant and persuasive. And we can see the persuasive element in Hort Hilföcker by the text, nations, listen to God's calling, come before his throne of grace. Comparatively, the text in Öffne dich characterizes the brilliance with the text, open now my heart to Jesus. He will come and enter there. This is necessary for the humility of a Christian. Gerechte Gott is in B flat major. Magnificent, yet, yet modest. 
Modesty in the face of a magnificent God is expressed in the text, Most righteous God, will you recall my sinful ways and transgressions? I seek the cross as my offering. Calm in mine is in B minor, and it's hard and unpleasant and desperate. Rhythm can also be used as an affect in music. Let me prove my point. Your challenge is to have no physical reaction to this. Ready? Did you do it? Did you move? Did you smile? Did you hate that song and remember everything that was bad about your teenage years? Good. Rhythm does that. Bach used rhythms in the same way. Albert Schweitzer, known for his analysis of Bach's music and, according to some researchers, over-analysis, identified the joy motive. In this case, it's a rhythmic pattern that signifies joy. It's a figure of three notes, two short and a longer third note. You can hear this in the journey. Short, short, long. Short, short, long. Short, short, long. Short, short, long. The same is true in Komen Mein Herzen's house. Komen Mein Herzen's house. Short, short, long. Short, short, long. It means come abide with me or be with me. And after being away from people for all, a whole long year of pandemic restrictions, I can fully understand the joy of invitation. Maybe that's not as attention grabbing as the journey, but nonetheless, Bach never stopped believing, <laughs> see what I did there, that this reaction in the body would occur. There are now expectations of etiquette from the audience. Silence was demanded during musical performances so that the needs of the listener can be met and their objectives of listening earned. The appeal of art through melodies and harmonies requires a consideration, perhaps even a devotion, so that their affects are not intruded upon. This also reminds the composer that no sound or silence is ever without value. In the context of music for worship, Bach wants more than guiding parishioners to a direct experience of a biblical event or doctrine from the liturgy. Bach's music was to make a connection into our hearts, quite literally, of the deeper meaning of Christ's sacrifice. Therefore, it was expected as listeners and congregants that we do all that we can to get out of the music what Christ did for us on the cross.
Bach did not pursue writing a biography of himself. He didn't leave any writings about who he was as a person, and it's really hard to piece together who he was as a human being. If you're trying to look at first-hand sources, you have to kind of recreate who he was from the surviving stories and notes and margins that we do have. And there is this tendency to make Bach into this great pious saint of a human, someone who illuminated the divine mysteries through being the greatest composer who ever lived. But this is to ignore what made Bach human. He was an incredibly hard worker, and he held everyone else to the same almost impossible standards. But he was also humble in the sense that he really didn't think of himself as a being especially talented. He saw himself as just someone who put in really, really hard work into what he did. Malcolm Gladwell introduced the idea that 10,000 hours is the time it takes to perfect a skill. He put in his 10,000 hours and became Bach. He didn't believe that his abilities in music were due to some kind of innate talent, even though it's easy to look at his genealogy and to think that. Instead, I believe he emphasized his productivity and lived a life that says that anyone who is obliged to be as industrious as he would could succeed equally well. And to me, that's really the most empowering way to look at the Enlightenment. I opened up this lecture with the idea of belief being the component of greatness in the musical life of J.S. Bach, and that this is different than just going through the biography of a person and singing some songs. There's a part of our brain that loves that. Our neocortex loves that stuff. It's responsible for our rational and analytical thought and language. It's the part of Bach's brain that loved numerology of music and religion, but it's our limbic brain that's responsible for our human behavior all of our decision making, and it has no capacity for language. And I know, I know, music is the universal language until you go to the math department and they say the same thing about algebra. In other words, when we analyze the biography, the historical facts and the figures of how many pieces Bach created, we can understand these vast amounts of complicated information, but it doesn't change our behavior. What Bach's music does is it speaks directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow, allow ourselves to rationalize it with the tangible things that we say and do. Many of us like to believe that music, but singing especially, is just the music of our hearts, and we just open our mouth and our soul comes out. Some people say, I just listen to my heart and let my soul guide me. Sorry, but those aren't the parts of your body controlling your behavior, and it's not what's controlling the continued study and adoration of Bach. It comes down to belief. It's easy to characterize any of the great composers, but that will possibly lead us to trivialize Bach's existence into facts and figures. If it comes down to belief, the actions and writings of Bach should clarify his intent. He began each composition by writing Yesu Yuva, or Jesus Help, or J.J., and he closed each piece by writing, Soli Deo Gloria, or To God Alone Be the Glory. Thank you. <laughs>